I said, gee, we've met before. We probably will. But anyway, this how he'll be our first guest. But I thought maybe what we do initially is just kind of want you introduce this this whole series business. Okay? Well, you choose is an organization that uh, devotes itself to education, uh, educating the public on uh, limited government, on First Amendment rights, on uh, issues that are fundamentally associated with founding principles and constitutionalism and the rule of law. Uh, you choose in the past has had big events every three or four months, but you choose was founded by three people, uh, Deborah Mervyn, uh, Glenn uh, Pelican, and Suzanne Gallagher. And two of our three people are now very, very heavily committed other places. Suzanne Gallagher is now the head of the Oregon Republican Party. So Deborah Mervyn and the, the rest of the You Choose board members, which include myself and people from Cascade Policy Institute and others, uh, have kind of changed our focus to where we aren't going to be sponsoring big events, but we will be placing speakers in all around Oregon uh, who are expert in particular areas. And uh, we, uh, I have been, you know, on your show three or right, four times speaking so. on K through 12 education and on First Amendment rights and on voting uh, integrity issues. Uh, Bruce and you choose got together and we decided that the third Sunday of every month you choose and Bruce Broussard would cooperate in putting together a show. We, Bruce uh, mapped out 10 or 11 issues that he wanted these shows to be built around. Uh, and this is our first show. And then the name of the whole <laughs> series uh, is Portland, A History of Big Dreams, Broken Promises because that's how we see much of what's going on in Portland. But actually, this was not necessarily a broken promise that we've started with. So next month, we're looking forward to uh, doing a show on uh, the new Oregon bill that allows people who are with no proof of identification to get driver's licenses. Uh, and some other immigration related issues. Uh, this is an experiment in cooperation, uh, and we'll see how it works. Well, yeah, yeah, seriously, it's really needed. You know, folks, in all due respect, we are, we're in an age right now that everyone has their own communication piece. It's called a smartphone. And for some strange reason, you know, everybody's got their own concept. We've got we got various tribes, if you will, among our ranks, and we're really in a, in a sort of a confused sort of a state, so to speak. And it, and it's so important to get the facts, and that's what I'm looking for in regards to you choose. And that's why I've joined you guys, and I think it's very very important. And I'm sure that the viewing audience will appreciate what you all are bringing to the table. I mean, and here's that's a good example. and that's what we deal with facts. I mean, obviously, we're committed to, to certain sorts of political theories, yeah. but when the facts counter the theory, we go with the facts. And so there are you choose people who are very much for uh, Measure 11 reform, mm -hmm. uh, and there are you choose people who are not for it. It depends on what facts are out there. We have an awful lot of people in our Speakers Bureau who are scientists. I am, my PhD is in the history of philosophy of science. And we're looking not for what other people call science, we're looking at actual science. Uh, what, what is out there? What is reality? Not what is our picture of reality. And we will sacrifice our picture of reality if it doesn't agree with the facts on the ground. And I think that that's what all of us need to do. Yes. 
Well, thank you. It's going to be a okay. pleasure. We really appreciate that very much. Thanks for Okay. Okay, good. Well, now going on to our first guest that you all have brought us on. I'm talking about our DA here, John Foote. I appreciate good this afternoon. very much. Okay, good. It's great. Uh, to be here. Thanks very much. Thank yeah. you. Okay, good. All right. Now let's get down to business. I mean, she, they've, we've sort of gotten this thing together, and you know, and I, what I've done, I've, I've sort of put down some questions that um, that uh, the DA is somewhat familiar with. He's basic, these are some basic questions that that are mostly asked, if you will, by the public, and I think this is going to be very interesting. So I'm just going to go down and down the line, and Love hopefully, to. John, you'll just go on, just go down. Sure. What is Measure Eleven? Well, Measure 11 was a ballot measure, and they get numbers. They get numbers when they're trying to get on the ballot, and then they get a number after they're on the ballot and passed or failed. And I, I forget which one it was, but let's just figure that it was Measure 11. It was okay. passed in 1994, took mm -hmm. effect in 1995, and originally, and it passed by a very wide margin. Yes. And in 1998, there was another ballot measure to repeal Measure 11, uh, which lost by even a wider margin closer to 80% voted in favor of it. So it's been on the ballot twice, once to pass it, once to repeal it. Mm -hmm. um, it is, by all accounts, well thought of by the public, although not widely understood in detail, but widely understood kind of in principle. And there has been a concerted effort for a number of years to discredit it as a piece of law with a lot of misinformation. Um, so, let me kind of give you an overview, okay. and then we can answer any questions sure. you might ask. Measure 11 originally had about 21 crimes in it. Uh, it a couple were added by the legislature after it was passed, um, and it had mandatory minimum sentence for those 21 crimes. If I had the statute, Oregon criminal statute book in front of you, it's about that thick. With all the crimes that uh, we have in our laws, many of them are misdemeanors. So the number of crimes under Measure 11 is a tiny fraction of all the crimes that uh, can be committed in Oregon. And it is statistically a very small number, too. But they tend to be the most violent crimes against people. Mm -hmm. Wide variety of sex crimes, not wide variety, but kidnapping in the first degree, sodomy in the first degree, rape in the first degree, sexual penetration with a foreign object in the first degree, sexual abuse in the first degree. Um, and then assault in the first degree, assault in the second degree, and then homicides, manslaughter in the second degree, manslaughter in the first degree, murder and aggravated murder. Um, there have been some crimes added and mixed around, but that's the backbone of it. And then in 19, in the mid-1990s, the district attorneys in this state, by the way, none of whom wrote Measure 11 or campaigned for it. Mm -hmm. It wasn't our creation. But we have found it to be a very important law in terms of holding people accountable who do very serious crimes. But we also felt like we could make some improvements. So we proposed legislation in the mid-1990s which took a number of the second-degree crimes, because kidnapping, a lot of these crimes, the second-degree crimes are in Measure 11 too, um, and increased the amount of judicial discretion to reduce the crime under certain factual findings. And, uh, and that was passed by the legislature at our request um, and now is part of the law. So the number of crimes in Measure 11 that actually have a pure mandatory minimum is less than 15 total now. Okay. Who's and the governor are, doing that time? Uh, uh, let's let's see. see, it would have been Governor Kitzhaber, Kitzhaber. Um, okay. who, who, who got elected at the same time the measure passed or maybe a year after okay. and then uh, was in office when the amendments were passed. Okay, okay. I'm um, sure we got so, that. Uh, now, what does Measure 11 do? Well, it takes these crimes and said, if you're convicted of one of these crimes, you face a mandatory minimum sentence. Um, and let's, I'll give you an example. Rape in the first degree, which is either sexual assault of a child under 12 or forcibly attacking an adult, carries a mandatory minimum sentence of eight and a half years before you're eligible for release. Hmm. I'll give you a, an experience. I was at a senior center, the Willamette View. It's a large residential facility in Milwaukee has hundreds of residents and they do candidate forms every year and I was on the ballot last year to run again because I'm an elected office and I was unopposed and I didn't usually go to these things but they asked me to come mm -hmm. and uh, and just talk about sentencing and uh, and I got asked about this about measure 11 so I was talking to the audience it was probably 150 seniors in mm -hmm. the room and I was explaining eight and a half years for rape in the first degree and most people don't think that's too too much mm -hmm. and uh, 
I wasn't getting any facial reaction in the audience hmm. until I suddenly realized, oh, you think that's too short. And every head in that room nodded. Now that, that is the affirmative. Yes. That is the usual reaction hmm. to these mandatory minimums. They are well thought of by the public. And when you see this polling about Measure 11, the polling that's trying to d discourage people about Measure 11, they don't tell people that. They're about all this other fluff, not about what's really in Measure 11. Here's a very, in addition to the fact that it gave us better sentences, because the average sentence for rape in the first degree before that, for somebody who had no prior record, which we don't really care about um, in this kind of crime, was about four years. With earned time, do about three, three and a half years. So it went from about three, three and a half years to eight and a half years. Not a huge jump, but we think a much more important one. So it gave us better sentences for violent crime, which we think is part of justice. And we can talk about that. Mm. What is the purpose of sentencing? Mm. But um, since Measure 11 passed in 1995 and took effect, violent crime in Oregon has dropped 50%. 50%? 50, 50, 5 Wow. In half. Um, and it's been quite remarkable. Now, people will say it's been dropping around the country. Well, first of all, it wasn't dropping in Oregon before Measure 11 passed. It was dropping nationally. But, of course, they had the sen tougher sentences around the country happened before they happened in Oregon. So maybe hmm. the other country, the rest of the country was moving more quickly than we were. Um, but number two, we had the second biggest drop of violent crime of any state in the United States other than New York State. So... Um, there have been remarkable results. The other remarkable thing about Measure 11 is that when it was passed against the will of the legislature, who would not toughen laws for violent crime, um, when it was passed, um, we were told that it was going to explode the prison population. Mm -hmm. And in fact, in 1996, they predicted that by now we would have 19,000, no, about four years ago, we would have 19,000 inmates, I think. And at the time, I think we had 11,000. So we've done it without locking up nearly as many people as they said we were going to. So we've been very moderated in how we did it. So by any measure, any reasonable measure, Measure 11 has been extremely successful. Um, it's done, it's, it, it's made it, it's created more justice in these crimes by stiffer sentences for these really serious crimes. It's helped us reduce the violent crime rate and we've done it in a very moderated way. So now, can we always make laws better? Sure. But Measure 11 itself has been a remarkable success. Mm -hmm. I was looking at this other one. It says basically about um, what is driving the call for the, for the reform. Well, um, I, this is a kind of a larger discussion. Um, and I want to give a little bit of history about sentencing in Oregon. Because okay. I've been around 32 years. I and I started out as a line prosecutor working for Harl Haas and then Mike Schrunk. And I've been on the elected DA in Clackamas County for 12 years. Hmm. Uh, and then in between, I was the acting director and the deputy director and the um, assistant director for the Department of Corrections for five years. So I was in Salem for a while. So I've seen kind of the wide mm -hmm. breadth of the system. And, and there's two general philosophies of sentencing, determinate and indeterminate, philosophically. Mm -hmm. And both of them have their arguments philosophically. Determinate sentencing says you will do basically the sentence you're given in court. That's what Measure 11 is, mm -hmm. and our sentencing guidelines is more like that. Indeterminate sentencing says you'll be given a maximum sentence, but the parole board will decide how much of it you serve based on how you're doing in prison. That's what we had in the 1980s when crime was exploding in Oregon. And we had a series of recessions, and the legislature didn't want to build any prisons. Mm -hmm. We had one of the smallest prison systems in the country. And the way they managed it was they let people out the back door early. For instance, I had a friend who was a patent lawyer in Portland, a classmate of mine in law school. Um, I would say he was a good Portland liberal. And uh, uh, he woke up one night and there was a guy in his living room. And uh, he chased him out of the house. And they caught him. Turned out he was a career criminal, a career burglar and thief. And... Uh, he uh, was prosecuted by the, the district attorney's office in Multnomah County. I didn't do the case, but he called me and told me about it. And he was given a convicted and given a 20-year sentence for burglary. Because of Class A felonies, most serious kind of burglary, residential home when somebody's in the home. 
This is pre-measure 11, pre-sentencing guidelines. So the maximum sentence was 20 years. Parole board decides when they get out. Well, they had all this crowding problem in the prison, so they turned that, the parole board turned that 20-year prison sentence to a six-month sentence. Six months. Six months. And what happened was my friend called me up one day and said, hey, I thought that guy got 20 years. I said, yeah. And he said, well, I was just on a street corner waiting for the walk sign to go on. He was standing next to me. Gee, wow. And I said, wow. Well, this happened over and over and over again. And it was a failure because the legislature would not bite the bullet and spend the money on prisons. So they managed it by backdoor releases. Hmm. By announcing big sentences, everyone's happy, and then you let them out the back door. Five-year sentences were 40 days. So people would get to prison and get out immediately. And the system was broken. Neil Goldschmidt came to the DAs in the mid-1980s and said, you know, what do we need to improve it? Because crime was going crazy. And we said truth in sentencing, mm -hmm. that what people get is basically what they serve. Mm -hmm. Let's start with that. So he said, okay. So as part of his initiative, he said, we're going to build some more prisons and we're going to create a sentencing guideline system where people will do at least 80% of their sentence and they can earn 20% off earn time and a very short transitional leave at the back end of 30 days. So they do all but one month and then 20% and they have to earn the 20%. And then they built the sentencing guidelines grid, which I should have brought with me because every prosecutor in Oregon has one. It has a grid and there are two axi. The vertical is the crime seriousness, okay. starting with the least serious to the most serious. And there are one, categories 1 through 11. Every crime in Oregon is ranked under the law on one of those, 11 being murders, mm -hmm. one being, these are felonies, not mm -hmm. misdemeanors. And then along the horizontal axis is the person's criminal history. The less serious on one end, more serious on the other. So the most serious block on the grid is in the upper left-hand corner. Most serious crime, most serious history. And then in each block, they put the Sentencing Guidelines Board calculated how many beds they could give to that grid block. And they did it in months. Hmm. So there would be a range of so many months that if you landed in that box, that was your presumptive sentence that you would serve minus 20% and the 30 days transitional leave. Hmm. And it was built on the capacity of the prison system at the time. Well, it's a very rational process. The problem was that it wasn't big enough, the prison system wasn't big enough to get adequate sentences back then. First of all, felony property criminals basically could not go to prison because there wasn't room for them. It, the, we saved all the beds for the violent crime first, which everyone agrees is more important. We still agree with that today. So there's a dispositional line on the grid, and if you're below it in the category, you can't go to prison. You're just ineligible to go. doesn't matter it's a felony. If you're a car thief, um, certain kinds of burglaries, identity thieves, you just can't go. Doesn't matter how many convictions you get, you can't go. 75% wow. of all felonies in Oregon don't get a prison sentence even now. That's a fact. That's a fact. 75% of all convicted Example, felons in the state. Same, same Car thieves, yeah. burglars, identity thieves. I mean, those are the classics. There's, but These it's are major issues. Yes, know. they are. But when we first did the sentencing guidelines, they couldn't go to prison. There just weren't beds for them. The beds were saved for the violent crime. But even those crimes, the sentences weren't long. As I said, rape one was three to four years. The governor, Goldsmith, said we're going to increase the prison capacity and we'll improve the grid. Because as we have more capacity, we'll increase the grid blocks. Mm -hmm. Well, he decided not to run again for reasons we didn't find out for years. Mm -hmm. And so we got Barbara Roberts and the whole thing stopped. It froze. This is never talked about in public, but that's what mm -hmm. happened. And for six years, the DAs tried to get the legislature to improve the grid, and they would not. That's the fertile ground upon which Kevin Mannix walked with Measure 11. That was the opportunity. Violent crime was out of control. The sentences were terrible. We had improved truth in sentencing with the guidelines grid, because now people were doing their sentences. Right. But we did, they weren't long enough. So, and, they, and we couldn't lock up certain people who were doing so much damage, car thieves and burglars and people like that, identity thieves. We couldn't incapacitate them for a while. Didn't matter how many times. So um, that's how we got Measure 11. And the legislature has never, in my career, increased the sentences for violent crime 
in 32 years. Not once. Not once. The only time we've gotten improved sentences for violent crime is when the citizens voted. And we are currently going through something with the legislature right now. Uh, we have gone through this every time since Measure 11 passed. They are trying to undo Measure 11. Hmm. And I keep telling them, well, the first problem you've got is trust. Because why would we trust that this is the end of it? And let me give you an example in a different area, property crime. Hmm. Okay, we're moving away from Measure 11. Hmm. Property crime. We had the same problem. We didn't have any capacity in the prison system till about 1995, and the legislature realized that, and they passed what's called a repeat property offender law at our request. Um, in the legislature, they didn't wait for a ballot measure. It was the only time they increased sentences for property crime ever. So, and it provided that if somebody got five felony convictions, they were eligible for a prison sentence. They didn't have to go, but they were eligible. It took five. 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 And it wasn't very adequate, but it was a start at least. And uh, that was the first stage. But it, property crime kept getting worse in Oregon. It, violent crime was going down, property crime was going up, and we still couldn't do anything with these people until they'd done a lot of damage. Because you know, most criminals do more than we catch. So um, in 2007, we had the same sort of setting as we had for violent crime. Property crime was going up, the legislature wouldn't do anything about it, despite all our requests. Me Kevin Mannix queued up Measure 61, which provided mandatory minimum sentences for property crime. Now, I was in the leadership of the DA's association mm -hmm. at the time, and I said, we, I don't want mandatory minimum sentences for property crime. Mm -hmm. It's too much. We need more flexibility. These are not this, I mean, we need to be able to lock them up when it's appropriate, but not be forced to when we don't think it is. So let's come up with an alternative to Measure 61. I approached Kevin Mannix, whom I know, and I said, hey, if we come up with an alternative, will you take your measure off the ballot? And he said, I'll, yeah, I'll talk about it. He didn't commit, but he said he was open. So we developed what became Measure 57. Hmm. And I went back to him and said, how about it? Well, it turned into an internecine war between the Republicans and the Democrats. I was yelled at by Governor Kulingowski in a room with other prosecutors that he would never make a deal with Kevin Mannix. And this goes back to their history. And, yeah. and so that deal fell apart. And we weren't able to keep Measure 61 off the ballot. But we got Measure 57 on. The legislature put on at our request as an alternative. Not mandatory minimums. It just toughened up the prior repeat property offender law from 1995. Made it so at your second felony conviction you're eligible to go, not your fifth. And it provided for a little bit more meat for the ones you just wouldn't stop. But it wasn't draconian. And I don't think anyone would think it was except people who philosophically just don't think people belong in prison. That's yeah. a different subject. Yeah. But so we got it on the ballot. I went out and campaigned for it. 57 beat 61. That became the law. And guess what happened? The legislature suspended it six months later because they said it would cost $75 million. And we told them that's not true. We're keeping stats. It's going to cost less than a tenth of that. And uh, it's a good investment. And we'll use it carefully like we did Measure 11. They didn't listen to us. They suspended it. Um, they're trying to kill it now in the legislature, permanently kill it. Um, and so when they ask me to t make a deal with them now, I say, well, I made a deal with you before. And you broke your word. Why would I do that again? It's crazy. So. Um, so what's happened in the last two years? Well, the governor, um, Governor Kulingowski has had three attempts to try and roll back the clock on sentencing. His first was about four years, it was called the Reset Committee. Okay. And he, he tried it and it didn't go anywhere. And it's on a shelf, I have a copy, the Reset Report. The DA who was on the Committee on Public Safety quit. Ed Caleb from Klamath County because he wouldn't put his name on the report because it really rolled, wanted to roll back all the sentencing. And that didn't go anywhere. And then two years ago, I lose track of time, but Governor Kitzhopper created the Commission on Public Safety, the first one in 2011, and it didn't have any prosecutors, any chiefs, any sheriffs, any judges, any defense attorneys. It had four elected uh, people from the legislature, two senators, two uh, uh, representatives, handpicked 
um, the Chief Justice and Governor Kulangowski chaired it, and one private citizen. I testified in the public hearing against what they were trying to do. Um, and they didn't pursue any legislation at that time because it was an election year, last year. Not, this, not 2012, but 2011, they were going into the election. They didn't want to ask the legislature to pass laws to reduce sentences in an election year. So they postponed it a year and brought it back in 2012. And after much complaining, they added a prosecutor and a judge and a defense attorney and um, uh, a trial judge and a sheriff. And uh, we met last year for about six months. And we had public hearings. They brought in an organization called the Pew Foundation yeah. back from Washington, D.C., a very large nonprofit um, that has a pretty reputable reputation. I'd never dealt with them before. But I was stunned at the way the commission was run. It was all orchestrated. It was all pre-planned. Hmm. And uh, I was the fly in the ointment because I kept saying, well, those aren't the facts. They were trying to describe Oregon in a way that it is not. They tried to describe us like we're Texas. In fact, they brought people out here from Texas to tell us how to do things. Hmm. Texas ranks, at the time, ranked number one in the country in its incarceration rate. That's the number of prisoners per, per citizen. We ranked, at the time, 33rd in the country. And we were supposed to learn from Texas. <laughs> they had uh, one of the highest violent crime rates. We were very low. Um, so. Um, the whole process was extremely frustrating. I tried to introduce the facts that we already do the things they say they want us to do. Like, for instance, that we have a low incarceration rate. Like the fact that 75% of all convicted felons in the state don't go to prison. Um, like the fact that our, that it, uh, our sentences aren't that long. Um, like the fact that, according to the Bureau of Justice Statistics, the national federal organization, we have the highest percentage of inmates in for violent crime of any state in the United States. Oh. And the lowest percentage of nonviolent crime, for nonviolent crime. We lead the country. Well, these are the things they say they want us to do. We're already doing them. <laughs> um, but they wouldn't listen. And they issued a commission report, which I uh, voted to pass out, but I also wrote a, an alternative report, which said there's a different way to do this. If it's about money, if it's about saving money, there are other ways to do this, which there are. And uh, it makes sense. It could both control the prison population and save money, but not eviscerate our sentencing laws. Okay. So let me talk. Let me stop. I've gone too long. No, no, it's, it's been good. It's been good. Now, let's go back to the, this Pew uh, in terms of the driving the call for mm -hmm. reform. Pew, what, when, when did it originate and what, what impact does it have? I really don't what know role, what originates. What role does it play in this? It's a, it's a nonprofit organization, I think, out of Washington, D.C. Okay. I think its, but it's, its tax report indicated a couple of years ago it had $280 million in revenue. Wow. It's a very large organization. It does a lot of national polls. You'll see its name on a lot of things. Hmm. And they've gotten very heavily into the whole sentencing issue around the country, and they've They've been in about 15 or 20 states. Their philosophy, they claim, is fact-driven, but in fact, based on my experience here in Oregon, it is really an anti-incarceration organization mm -hmm. that wants just simply to reduce the number of people in prison, um, but they never admit that. And they have a very pre-programmed way of approaching a state. They have certain, you can go on their website and find the reports that will tell you, well, you do this, and you do this, and you do this, and you do this, and that's how you get the public to buy into reducing sentences. Problem is, they don't work in Oregon very well because we've already done a lot of this mm -hmm. stuff. And so yeah, they've had to fish for the facts that they say um, make their argument when in fact most of the facts fly in the face of what they're arguing. And they have been a major driver in this. Right now they have as many as 10 lobbyists in Salem. Wow. 10. And this is supposed to be a non-profit, not an advocacy group. So. They've sort of hijacked the process um, with the permission of the leadership in the, on the, uh, in the legislature, mm -hmm. but it's really been disturbing. Mm, interesting. I'll tell you what we do. We're going to take a short break, and then when we come back, um, we're going to see if the DA will get back, get into some other areas, like um, how successful is the Oregon State Prison? Okay. Mm -hmm. that, uh, what, in your view, are the criteria <laughs> for success? And, and then the other one is, uh, again, some of my viewing artists, does Measure 11 have a desperate uh, impact on minorities? I think that's another issue. That okay, we want to sure. Talk about. Okay, sure. we'll take a short break. We'll be right back.
You are watching Oregon Voters Digest. This program can be seen again on these channels on these dates and times. Tell a friend. it better mm -hmm. in many many areas and I think it's the most successful part of state government in the last 25 years by far in terms of the investments paying off mm -hmm. does that mean that we should stop trying to improve it no um, but my suggestions about how to improve it are not to cut sentences mm -hmm. they are to control costs in the prison system itself more effectively by putting more pressure on costs per inmate which no one wants to take on um, and there are, I'll give you an example of something Pew did on this subject. When I got on the commission, the DAs asked me to serve as their representative. I didn't really want to do it, but they asked because I have this experience in my background. I said, okay. I said, well, one of the subjects I want to talk about is cost per day per inmate. How much are we spending per inmate per day and can we do better? And that, I was told specifically that we weren't allowed to talk about that. And I said, well, I'm gonna, I want to talk about it anyway. So I don't care. How can you talk about saving money and not talk about that? Mm -hmm. Is it just cutting sentences? And especially when we already have moderate sentences. So I got it into the conversation. The sheriff on the commission also wanted to do it. So they conceded. And Pew had a presentation on it to the commission in July. We had a meeting every month, one in June, one in July, one in August. And at the July meeting, they presented to us that the average cost per day in Oregon was $82 and, or $84 a day, something like that, 82 or 84. And uh, that that was about 80 to 90 percent of the true costs. Huh. And then in August, they gave us a slide as part of another presentation about why people not being in prison is more economical. And they had a slide, which I still have, which shows how much each county spent on its prisoners, state prisoners, you know, multiplying cost per day. Right. Uh, this is how much yours cost, going from Multnomah County the highest all the way down. So you add all those up and it was $164 a day. So I wrote, after the commission was over, I wrote to Pew and said, can you explain why you have two different numbers? You gave us 82, but your slide said, if you add them up, it's 164. Uh -huh. And uh, they were back very kind of, John, you don't really understand kind of attitude, the eighty-four, $82 is the true cost. This other, you shouldn't add those up that way. That's not how you really compute true costs. Well, what Pew didn't know was that I knew about another study they'd done in June of last year, before the commission started, a national study called Time Served, in which they had computed the cost per day in 35 or 36 states. Hmm. Guess who was number one? Oregon. On their study, yes. at $175 a day, in 2009. So they were using different numbers depending on who they were talking to. Mm -hmm. That was so emblematic of the problem with Pew. They just wouldn't get straight about it. Now I've told now that the legislature won't consider cost per day. Do you know the Department of Corrections in its budget for the next two years has added a 10 percent increase in their cost per day. I have the sheet. It's more than eight dollars on their projection of cost. Mm -hmm. It's more than eight dollars a day. For every dollar you reduce it, you save ten million dollars over the buy-in. Hmm. So if you cut their ten percent increase in half, you would save forty million dollars. Which is what the governor says he wants to use to invest in local communities in public safety. You could do it by just reducing the increase in cost per day. But I can't get anyone to listen. Hmm. Hmm. And you know there are a lot of reasons for it, but um, this is one of the things that's frustrating about this whole process. You know, John, let me ask you another question. I, I wanted another guest to come on and talk a little bit about this whole IRS thing. Jeff Reynolds is the local chair of the Republican Party, but I think we need more time to do that, and, and I'm sure Jeff will understand that. But I need to ask you this other question, and at the, it's, it's, it's a very important one. You know, the whole concept of, of doing the crime, uh, doing the time, and then getting back out in society and you're a whole person mm -hmm. again. 
are there any discussions on this commission about that? Is there, is there, are there discussions about that? And, and, and what, where do we go from that? Right now, it's kind of like saying, gee whiz, I, uh, you know, my son has done the time, done the crime, he's done the time, and he comes back to the same area where he committed the crime, gets right back into the same situation, and he's right back in the institution again, can't get a job, I mean, just on and on and on. Are we discussing this kind of an issue on the table? Well, we always discuss okay. in individual cases what's going on with the person. The defense comes to us and explains the dynamics of it. Uh, and it's obviously discussed when people are released from prison with parole people yeah. and stuff. Yeah. And that's beyond my job. But in my mind, just a bigger picture, there are yeah. two reasons, generally reasons why what we shoot for in sentencing. And the first, number one, goal in sentencing is justice yes and justice really is that the person is generally convicted of what they did not guilt not innocent people being convicted because that's the opposite of justice nobody cares more about that than a prosecutor in good faith um, and number two that the sentence is proportional to the crime as in a fair sense that's not an exact science there are people who radically disagree but there, it's kind of a bell curve, and most people are kind of in the middle. This kind of crime, eight and a half years doesn't sound too unjust for a forcible rape, mm -hmm. right? I mean, that's, mm -hmm. and if you hit the kind of general place where people will say that's fair, not that everyone will agree, you've kind of hit justice. Mm -hmm. Now the second part of sentencing is can we change the behavior? This commission has focused all its attention on that. And a lot of that is uh, without our, without, is beyond my control or your control, it's in the control of the person. And we all know how difficult change is. I quit smoking 40 years ago. It was the hardest thing I ever did. I had to quit 100 times. It changes hard. It, we, we give it too much lip service. So people to change their behavior is not easy. Um, but ultimately, it starts with the decision inside. We don't want to create impediments. We want to give people opportunities. But we can't substitute their will. That's the first thing I'd say. The second thing is that there are studies, there's a really, really interesting research psychologist at UCLA named David Farabee who's written about this, and he has concluded that the single most important thing to get people to stop committing crime is the certainty of being caught. And he supports this HOPE probation program in Hawaii that Judge Alm there has created, which is fantastic. And I applied for a federal grant to do a pilot project in Clackamas County and we're in the first year of our two year. I believe in that. Mm -hmm. And for the vast majority of people who don't go to prison in Oregon, the 75% of convicted felons and all the misdemeanors who, who are ineligible to go, we have twice as many of those as we do felons. Mm -hmm. So if you add up them all, it's about 90% of the people we prosecute aren't going to prison. How can we be more effective with that group? And he says, by making it clear to them they're going to get caught, and the punishments don't have to be that great. They just have to be immediate. And they have mm -hmm. to be certain that you're going to get, and we do that with, he does it with drug testing. They drug, he drug tests everybody every week. Mm -hmm. And if they get, if they're dirty or they don't show up, they arrest them. They go to jail for two days. And it has a, it's had a dramatic impact on drug use. I think it has profound implications for how we supervise people in the community, which is what most of the people we have are. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we, that is an area ripe for change, mm -hmm. I think. You know, the other thing is is the, the whole idea of being a productive citizen once they do get out. Mm -hmm. And uh, when they are in the institution and incarcerated, they're sort of in a, uh, you know, in a, in a controlled sort of an environment. And a lot of times, most of those people are there in most cases because of education. Let's say maybe education aspect of it, uh, or lack of, and whatever. And uh, so you ask yourself the question, well, what are the system, what's the system doing about that? I mean, I realize the GED, but in all due respect, a true education is actually classroom work, you know what I mean, teacher one-on-one, -on -one, that type yeah. of routine. Mm -hmm. And then the job, you know, we've got, we've got jobs, I mean, they're there, I mean, you gotta, we got trades kind of jobs that we used to have at one point in time, remember? The idea mm -hmm. of trades and this, that, and the other, but then all of a sudden we got out of that, that arena or whatever. We got about one minute. Can you answer that real quick? Brian? Sure. In fact, I think the biggest thing is not those things, although those are okay. important, for, yeah. but it's about family. Family. And how people are raised and how the family has changed in this country and uh, the things that kids are exposed to. You, We're not even talking about the social service aspect of the courts with people, kids at risk and families at risk, mm -hmm. which is a huge problem out of which a lot of these kids, these young people come. Okay. It's really not about jobs or anything. It's about how kids are raised. Now, 
single parents with no resources, that just is a terribly difficult mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. We could encourage people to not have kids quite so quickly mm -hmm. until they're ready. Mm -hmm. um, I am a life, I was a lifelong Democrat, just to make this clear. I am not a Republican or a Democrat. I'm a non, I'm a non-party now. I'm, I'm an independent. I became an independent when I became DA. Um, this is not about party. This is about doing the right thing, the smart thing, the practical thing. Um, based upon facts. Good, good, good. Well, John, this has been just great. I, I, I wanted to spend more time with it in terms of for some of these young people out there might be pursuing a career being a DA. I got about two, three seconds or so. Can you say something real quick, Mike? About I ended up a DA by accident. By I accident. had a girlfriend who told me I liked to argue I should go to law school, which changed my life. I was a teacher and a counselor for emotionally disturbed kids back east at the time. And uh, it's been a great thing for me. I found my calling. I'd say do what you're passionate about. You know, left doing the right thing. On that note, thank you very much, John. It's been a pleasure. And okay, here good. as well. Thank you, Pat. Thanks very much, folks. And again, thanks for you choose for bringing us this series. And we're going to be doing this on a monthly basis. Again, thank you very much. And as George Page, my old friend, who's not here with us, in back to what you believe in. Have a good one.